morning. Welcome to each and every one of you. In the audience today, we have some of our wonderful students, dedicated faculty, of course, hardworking staff, our campus leadership team, colleagues from across the district, retirees, friends, and family. We are here together to enjoy Florissant Valley's most enduring and endearing tradition, the David L. Underwood Memorial Lecture. We will start the morning with the musical talent of Professor Paul Higdon, our 2015 Underwood Lecturer, Communications Department Chair, and Music Program Coordinator. Paul will play selections from Claude Debussy's Estan. Selections he has chosen specifically with Janice Nesser Chu in mind. Enjoy.
are waiting for the stage to be cleared. Bravo, Paul. You make it seem effortless, but we know it's not. Thank you for uplifting us with your music and for setting the tone for even more wonderful things to come. This morning, it is my pleasure and great honor to introduce the 42nd recipient of the David L. Underwood Memorial Lecture, Janice Nesser Chu. My name is Sharon Fox, and I have the pleasure of working in our campus library, which is named after David Underwood. As the 2014 recipient of this award, tradition dictates that I make the introduction this morning. Otherwise, I think I'd have to take a ticket and stand in line to do so. Speaking of past recipients, we have many previous Underwood lecturers in the audience this morning. I'd like these inspirational individuals to stand so we can acknowledge them. of the Underwood Award demonstrate the values of our campus dean of instruction, David Underwood, who served the college until his untimely death in 1975. Dean Underwood was known for his love of education and he himself was beloved. He was deeply concerned with the welfare of students, faculty, and staff. His dedication went well beyond office hours and he generously gave up his time and talents to further the college's educational mission. Dean Underwood's wife, Annabelle, and daughter, Kathleen, are dedicated to the Florissant Valley community as well. They have attended each announcement of the recipient in April and each lecture in August for the last 42 years. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> wonderful to see you each year, twice a year. <laughs> Chosen by a committee of peers, recipient of this most prestigious honor, exhibit excellence in instruction and a genuine humanistic concern for students, faculty, and staff, and all of education. In my mind, this year's award recipient stands on the shoulders of Dean Underwood, and in fact is a dean herself serving as the academic dean of liberal arts. Janice Nesser Chu is much more than a dean. She is a generous colleague, a loyal friend, an honest sounding board, and she has a keen sense of social justice, often playing devil's advocate by asking probing questions. She is a second generation Lebanese Maronite American, a devoted wife and aunt, an avid gardener, and a pluophile, which Jan taught me as a lover of rain. She has the great gift of caring about things that truly matter. Janice is an educator in every sense of the word. She is a storyteller, a writer, a photographer, an artist, curator, and social activist, especially for women's issues. 
Janice has served in many roles on this campus, including adjunct faculty member, associate professor of art, photography program coordinator, gallery director, and chair of the Arts and Humanities Department. Janice has received numerous awards for her teaching, her art, and her activism. They include the Adria for Trailblazing Women Award, the Emerson Award for Excellence in Teaching, the Faculty of the Year Award, and the Freedom of Human Spirit Award in 2014. She also received the President's Award for Art and Activism at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Dean Nesser Chu serves on local and national art boards, including Art Table and the Women's Caucus for Art, where she also serves as legacy director. She has exhibited her own work, both locally, nationally, and internationally, for over 25 years. I could go on, of course. However, I am leaving many of today's important acknowledgments and the sharing of her own story to Janice herself. So sit back, immerse yourself in the experience, and enjoy. I present to you the 42nd recipient of the David L. Memorial Lecture Award, Janice Nesser Chu. rise as high as the support of the tribe we are in. And I have a very supportive tribe. First, I'd like to thank Mrs. Annabelle Underwood and her daughter, Kathy Underwood Herman, for believing in her husband's and father's vision and carrying on his legacy. I want to thank them for their continued commitment to our college, to our community, especially our community here on the Florissant Valley campus. The Underwood Award, is something that is uniquely Florissant Valley. It is our history. It is our identity. It is our story. It is our tribe. I would also like to thank the 41 Underwood recipients who have come before me and built this foundation on which we stand today. It is your commitment, your passion, your talent that made Florissant Valley into a beacon in our North County community that offers hope and opportunity to our next generations of leaders. You are my tribe. Thank you to my colleagues and friends who have over the last 16 years have given so much to me, more than I can ever even say. You have mentored me, you have supported me, you have listened to me, you've argued with me, you've laughed with me, and yes, sometimes you've even cried with me. You've told me when I'm doing something right, and you never hesitate to tell me when I'm doing something wrong. And I appreciate, and I love you, and I've grown so much because of you, as a person, as an educator, and as an administrator, because all of you, you are my tribe. I would be remiss if I did not thank my husband and best friend, Ben Chu, for being here today. For over 35 years, yeah, 35 years, he has been my biggest supporter and cheerleader. I couldn't have ever done any of this without his love and support. Ben, you are always my tribe. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the leadership team who are in the house today. And if I miss anybody, I'm sorry, because I didn't see everyone. But I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Langer for being here, our Provost Elizabeth, Dean Steve White, Dr. Carol Apartis, um, De uh, Dean Deb Carter, and Kedra Tolson. Thank you for being here. You are my tribe. I'd like to thank the nominating committee, Paul, Sharon, and Cindy, for choosing me as the 42nd Underwood recipient and for seeing something in me and my service that they felt needed to be acknowledged and celebrated. You guys are my tribe. I would like to thank the Underwood Production Tribe. I know you often don't hear of that, but the Underwood does have a production tribe. And that's Marie and T and Christine Giancola 
Nagel Pilarsic and Drew Foster and Karen Wade and Carol Hoagland and Alex Nugent for their work in helping pull off today's presentation because we have over 55 slides and five videos today. <laughs> I especially want to thank Marie for all her work with the set design and for making all those rugs for everybody's frogs. Marie, you rock. Christine, thank you for photographing and collecting and retouching all my old family photos that now I have something to treasure from today. You are my tribe. And to Nako Pilarsic, who's going to knock your socks off with the end video today. Nako, you rock, girl. You are my tribe. And to Paul and to the Umso Percussion Ensemble, who will appear later, I want to thank you for your musical selections today. You are my rocking tribe. Those of you who know me know while I'm really kind of open and receptive person, and I talk too much and often talk too loud, I'm not one to share very intimate feelings or details of my personal life. I would drive the last dean crazy, Mary Lukey, who's sitting right over there, because she'd always say, how you doing today, girl? How you doing, Jan? And I would say, I'm fine. And she'd say, you can't be fine all the time. You know, like I said, I don't tend to share a lot of personal feelings, but I tend to share stories. In the classroom, I find that I'm a storyteller. In our bi-weekly liberal arts news, I always try to share some kind of story about gardening or where I went that weekend. I use stories to bridge divides, to inform, to inspire, and to build the tribe. So I'd like to begin today with the story of what brought me to the stage and to this topic, We Are Tribe. I call this story simply, a woman, her dogs, and how I found out I was the 42nd David L. Underwood Memorial Lecture Award recipient. <laughs> Perhaps you know of the woman I speak, Cindy Campbell. Cindy had hounded me for weeks to come to her office so I could look at pictures of, guess what, her dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but she just didn't want me to look at pictures of her dogs. She wanted me to use, as she said, your artistic eye to tell me how to arrange these portraits of my dogs on my living room wall. Now in my entire life as an artist, no one has ever asked me how to arrange pictures of their dogs on the wall. But Cindy, you know, she can be a little bit persistent, just a little. And finally, after a couple times of canceling, sorry Cindy, on her, I finally made it to her office. I thought, well, I'm going to go in, I'm going to look at a couple pictures, and I'm going to get out of here. But no, Cindy said, oh, come on, let's go over to the conference room. I go, the conference room? She, go, she said, yeah. And I walked into the conference room, and she laid out probably a dozen and a half Xeroxed images of her dog all across the table. <laughs> now, at first, I thought she wanted me to suggest maybe a, pick a couple of good pictures, tell me which ones are good to put on my wall. But no, she had planned on blowing up all those images, 11 by 14 and larger, printing them on canvas, and arranging them on a nine foot long wall. I mean, I knew Cindy loved her dogs, but this was a little much. You know, we went back and forth for over an hour. She kept me there an hour looking at pictures of dogs. And then she says, well, you know, I have another wall in my house, in my bathroom. And I'm like, huh? And she's like, yeah, where I would like to put up about 41 little images of my dogs. Maybe, maybe kind of like in a grid pattern. And I said, you really want to put pictures of your dogs in a grid pattern in your bathroom? And she goes, yeah. And I thought, oh, where's Emily Lasik? I need to call counseling. <laughs> But she kept insisting, and she said, yeah, and I think I want them little two-by-two two images. And I go, 41 two-by-two two images on your wall. And she said, yes. And then she pulled out the piece of paper and said, just like this, and kept pointing to this layout. I looked down at the grid, but I didn't really look at the images. And then she kept saying, and I think I would like two big ones at the bottom. And I said, 41 images, two big ones at the bottom. And again, she kept pointing at the layout. At the layout. <laughs> I mean, I kept trying to talk her out of it, you guys. Who puts 41 images of their dogs in a bathroom? Anyway, finally, I stopped just 
looking at the design, because as an artist, I wasn't really looking at the images, I was just looking at the design, and I looked at the bottom, and I saw an image of me and David Underwood. And I realized at that point that, oh my God, am I the Underwood recipient? And I said to her, oh my God, am I the Underwood recipient? <laughs> and she said yes, and I said, oh, thank you very much, and I changed the subject. <laughs> Now, I'm not often speechless, you guys, but at that point, I didn't really know what to say. I walked back to my car, I looked down at the images, and then I felt this kind of wave of emotion come over me. I was an Underwood recipient? Really? Wow. I was moved by the honor, although Cindy would say I didn't show it. Actually, she was really worried about me for weeks. She kept going, aren't you excited? Aren't you excited? And I kept going, yeah, yeah, great. Kind of like what I would do with Mary. <laughs> But I think kind of the enormity of this, this task ahead of sharing with all of you some idea, some vision, some uplifting moments, just kind of made me, for the once, speechless. It was at that moment I looked down at the images in my hand and I realized that I had just entered another tribe, a tribe that would forever define me. And I thought about the idea of tribe and the many tribes that I've been a part of in my life and the importance of belonging to a tribe. It is at that moment the concept for this lecture was born. I have always known the importance of tribes and over the years have read a lot about the concepts of tribes, culturally, socially, and in the workplace. I was well aware of both the positive and the negative impact of tribes, but I knew I was going to talk about tribes and how they can define us and how they can uplift us, the importance of tribes. I planned my acceptance speech in April as the introduction to today's lecture, kind of a sneak peek into the Underwood speech in August. I spoke about STLCC and especially about Florissant Valley and how it was my tribe, and I read a poem by Lynn Ann Brown called We Are Tribe. Ironically, that night after my acceptance speech, I went home from work. I turned on the TV set just to kind of clear my head. Now, I, know, I don't know about you, but I always turn on the TV or the radio when I get home just to kind of open up these spaces in my head after a really tough day. And I wanted to think about what I could do or say with this concept of tribes. Should it be something more personal? Should I be more academic? And lo and behold, in the midst of all the political talk and psychobabble coming out of the television set, someone was talking about tribes. I thought, this is a sign. It has to be. However, to my surprise, I heard the exact opposite of how I was feeling about my tribes, and especially the tribe at St. Louis Community College. The word tribe has had historically and socially different connotations, and it was once again being used in a negative way. The analyst was complaining that our entire political chaos was because we were in tribes and we refused to come out. Now to say that this kind of smacked in the face of everything I felt about tribes was an understatement. He went on to say that everything that's wrong with our country and our culture is because we are in tribes. It's what separates us instead of bringing us together. And I seriously thought, have I chosen a topic that I have such an affinity to? But are tribes a bad thing? My initial response, of course, you know, because I'm an educator, was to sit down and start to research. I found tons of information on the concept of tribes, and of course, tons of music. I listened to a lot of Quest Call Tribe for a while, videos along with New Age blogs, and probably a dozen to two dozen TED Talks. Then I went back to the books, and there was this, of course, the traditional definition of a tribe. A tribe is viewed developmentally or historically as a social group existing before the development of or outside of states. A tribe is a group of distinct people dependent on their land for their livelihood who are largely self-sufficient and not integrated into the national society. It is perhaps the term most readily understood and used by the general public. Stephen Curry defines tribal people as those who have followed ways of life for many generations that are largely self-sufficient and are clearly different from the mainstream or dominant society. Hmm. And then there was the de dictionary definition of tribe, simply tribe a noun. A tribe is a group of people or a community with similar values or interests. 
a group with a common ancestor, or a common leader. And then there's Seth Golden's seminal book on tribes. You know, mostly everybody in leadership has read. Um, it's called Tribes. We need you to lead us. But in it, he writes, a tribe is any group of people, large or small, who are connected to one another, a leader or an idea. For millions of years, humans have joined tribes, be they religious, ethnic, political, or even musical. Think of the deadheads. It's our nature. Now, that the, now the internet has eliminated the barriers of geography, <coughs> cost, and time. All those blogs and social networking sites are helping existing tribes get bigger and enabling new tribes to be born. Groups of 10 or 10 million who care about a political campaign or a new way to fight global warming. So I thought, well, that can't be bad. Put simply, a tribe is a group of people, and that group only needs two things to be a tribe, a shared interest and a way to communicate it. That can't be bad at all, I thought. So he taught us as geography. Geography is important for tribes, and now we have the ability to form tribes because of Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter. So I thought about tribes and why we need them and how personally they have impacted my life. Tribes are not just created out of thin air, but are brought together by commonalities, some inherent, others not. There are many motivations for joining tribes. Purely social, to feel less alone and to connect with people near and far, or pursue shared interests. Values in social, to connect with others who share the same values in a social setting. Cultural and social, to share experiences with people of the same country, to speak the shared language, and to observe cultural traditions together. And business and social, to develop relationships with others in the same industry, or expand network into other industries and markets. We all have a basic need to connect with other human beings, whether that be on a social level, on a political level, or on a business level. Making friends, connecting with others, sharing experiences, keeping up with popular culture, and keeping up with current trends and developments in our own community are all ways and reasons for connecting with people or forming a tribe. There are all kinds of tribes. Families are tribes. Friends are tribes. Neighborhoods are tribes. Vegans are tribes. Trekkies are tribes. <coughs> sports teams are tribes. I got ahead of the sports team. And women are tribes. When you connect with others in a fashion that allows you to develop a relationship that is especially useful, these long-term connections, our tribes, are very helpful in guiding you through life as well as making you happy. Human beings as a group are a tribe that's just defined by our biology. And we are one, of course, that is relatively new to the scene, only about 200,000 years old, that's all. But frogs, on the other hand, they've existed for millions of years. In 1995, a team of scientists discovered fossils of what is to be believed to be the earliest known frog and of all places in Navajo territory. The fossils dated back 190 million years. It's interesting that this long ago leaper was given the name of Prosarius vitus. The Latin prosalier means to leap forward, and the Navajo vitus means high over it. And it is because of this name that I chose my musical gift for you today. To always remember and to remind you to move forward and to leap higher over any difficulty or any challenges, to always stay in motion. Now, unlike Osiris Vitus, we humans, we not only leapt forward, but we climbed out of that muck, and we did so fairly fast. And one of the reasons, tribes, and why, because tribes allow us to accomplish things. They support us. One plus one is always greater than one in one. Deep in our bones, we are all tribal beings. For me, there are about five tribes, and I've been a part of dozens, maybe even hundreds more, that kind of stand out in my life. These are the tribes that formed my identity, supported me, encouraged me, and gave me the space to grow and change. Today I'm going to share with you my personal experience of my tribes, 
with the hopes that with the hopes that you find something in my story that's your story something you may now know or something that you have buried for a long time very deep inside my first experience of a tribe of course began when i was a child on my father's side of the family we came from a family of immigrants who journeyed from Hashit, Lebanon. Hashit is a small Maronite Catholic village nestled in the mountains of Lebanon. I come from a family of woodworkers and carpenters. They own land that was filled with majestic cedars of Lebanon, a symbol of strength, perseverance, and their religion. They came to St. Louis in 1898 through Ellis Island where of course they changed our name from Nassar to Nasser, and everybody always asked me if I'm German, but I'm not. <laughs> they came to a small section of St. Louis downtown along Lenore K. Sullivan that was kind of bounded by what was Shoto and LaSalle Street. And there they kept their traditions alive, their language, their customs, their food, and their religion. During the period of mass migration from 1880 to 1924, more than 20 million immigrants entered the U.S. Approximately 95,000 of these immigrants were from what was called at that time Greater Syria. Today that would be Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, and Israel. At the time, the majority of the Arab countries were colonized by the Ottoman Empire, which ruled the Arabs all the way from 1500 to 1917. Political repression, economic instability, and the war subsequently led many Arabs to come to the U.S., much like that story today. However, the majority of the Arabs that came at this time were Lebanese Syrian Christians. Many settled in cities like New York, Boston, Detroit, and St. Louis, where textiles, peddling, and the automotive industries promised employment. My family came with the hopes of filling a wheelbarrow full of gold and go home. Like many immigrants, they were told that the U.S. was just paved in gold, and you could just pick up the gold and go back home. But instead, they settled here, and they never, ever returned. As a small child, being Lebanese meant very simple things to me. Saturday mornings, waking up to the sounds and smells emanating from the kitchen as my aunt would prepare us food for our Sunday family gatherings. The clatter of bowls, the click of knives on the cutting board, the whispered tones as they gossiped in broken Arabic, and the smell of bread baking on the oven floor. And then there were Saturday evening gatherings at the church that included my cousin Karim always playing the oud. <laughs> and do the dub key. There comes a Middle Eastern dance that originated like a lot of different countries, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, all those different countries. So it's, it's a really fun dance. We get their people to go over the place that were Arabs and not Arabs here. On Sundays that always included everyone gathering around the table. Aunts, uncles, neighbors, friends, and cousins, and of course, always to come and eat food. And not just any food, but Lebanese food. My aunt Joe would always say, there is no food in the world like Lebanese food. And we from Hachi, we make the best gibby in the world. Everyone loves it. I could eat it seven days a week. And you see, there's no Lebanese gathering that ever happens without that staple. And it's not bread, and it's not rice, it's kibbeh. 
You see, my Aunt Jo, like my entire family, was very proud of our heritage, despite the negative comments she heard on the bus or at work. I remember one time when she came home after working a 12-hour shift in the sewing factory, and she was whispering to my Uncle George, that idiot, he told me to go back to my country, and I said, this is my country. I was born here. She was four foot eight inches tall, but she was mighty. And as I grew, I understood my tribe was not just about being Lebanese, but also about being Maronite Catholic. The Maronite Catholic Church is one of the largest Eastern Rite communities of the Roman Catholic Church and is most prominent in Lebanon. It is the only Eastern Rite church that, church that has no non-Catholic or Orthodox counterpart. And as I said earlier, my family came from Hatshith, Lebanon, and everything that happens in that town centers on their faith, their history, their tribe, and their church, St. Romanos. Now let me give you a little history of the church as it's kind of integral to the story of my family and my tribe. Christianity came from Judaism, and as the church expanded the realm of Judaism, it adapted itself to the people and the cultures in which it took root. The cultural adaptation resulted in 22 different rites in the Catholic Church today. It is from the Jewish roots that the Church of Antioch sprung. In fact, the Church of Antioch, founded by St. Peter, was where the terms Christian and Catholic were ever first used. Evidence from archaeological studies of Maronite church buildings, they show that they earlier had been synagogues. To this day, the Maronite church retains its Jewish roots more than any other Catholic church. And it's evidenced in their use of Aramaic, which was the language of Jesus, Syriac, and by the prayers which remain faithful to Semitic and Old Testament forms. The Maronites, they trace their heritage back to two figures. The first two, St. Maron, are Moron, a hermit of the fourth and fifth centuries, now, under the many disputes that the Christians were having about the divinity and the humanity of Christ in the 14th and 15th centuries, the arguments became very heated in Antioch. And under the leadership of Morun, a group of monks left the city for peace and quiet and went up to the mountains. Lay people followed and clergy followed those monks. And then later, we also trace our heritage to St. John Maron, again, Yehubana Marun, both of them Marun, uh, who was the Patriarch of Antioch from 685 to 707, and under whose leadership the invading Byzantine armies of Justin were routed, making the Maronite Lebanese a fully independent people. Later, during the Arab invasion and during the Arab and Byzantine wars, the Maronites fled to Cyprus and to the safety of the mountains that today is Hashit. Like in Hashit, my family's life centered around a small Maronite Catholic church on LaSalle Street that was a renovated four-family flat called St. Raymond's. Today, the old church is gone, and in its place stands St. <coughs> Raymond's Cathedral. The, the cathedral that is the eparchy of the West has a pastoral center, a cultural center, a shrine, and holds the Maronite Heritage Institute. It stands as a testament to the migration and the impact the Lebanese can have on the St. Louis community, the impact that immigrants have on our community. I grew up deeply ingrained in that religion, both as a doctrine and as identity. It set me apart from the other kids I went to school with. I didn't go to church with them on Sundays. I definitely wasn't blonde haired and blue eyed. And my family spoke a language that was not theirs. As a matter of fact, I think the only indoctrination anybody ever had or talked about to me was watching old Danny Thomas videos on TV. <laughs> gather around and go, look, it's Lebanese people. Are they going to eat goofy this week? <laughs> so on Saturdays, we would go to the church. On Saturdays and Sundays, we go to the church to learn about our story, culture, and our religion, our tribe. 
I was in a Lebanese folk dance group that performed at international events in Huffley's, which are kind of like Arab parties or weddings, and I sang in the church choir. At a time that everyone wanted to assimilate into the American culture, we stood as a testament that you could belong despite your differences. Many would shy away from differences, but they made my family proud, they made them strong, and they made us all very defiant. You see, it was my tribe. It was my history. It was my identity. And three generations later, it is not only my tribe, but that of my nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews. For even though they may be two times, three times, four times removed, they still belong to the tribe and they still wear it proudly. And though many of them are blonde haired and blue eyed, they say, I'm Lebanese. It is evident in their words, their faith, their commitment, and their social and political actions. That's the interesting thing about tribes, that you often, you just belong. You can join one or you don't, but they don't own, but, but you don't own them, they actually own you. And there's another side to my family, and that's my mother's side. And they were actually Scotch-Irish and settled in the mountains of Appalachia. Coming from a very proud and loud Middle Eastern family, my mother's side for me is really just a vague memory. You see, we were Lebanese, we were Maronites, that was it, that was our tribe. A few years back, after my mother's death, I decided to try and understand something about her, about her family, about her tribe. That was the first time I actually realized and thought about it that both sides of my family came to America looking for a better life, that they both came from the mountains, that they both had a love of the sacredness of that kind of space and place, and that music filled both of their worlds. It's interesting, the first time I ever heard kind of Scotch-Irish music, I kind of felt this twinge of something familiar, and I quite wasn't sure what it was. Maybe the cadence reminded me a little bit of Arabic music, and I researched it, but I found no specific connection. And then I stumbled across this melding of the traditional Arabic oud that you heard earlier, and the bass and fiddle traditional instruments of the Scott Irish in the work of a Middle Eastern band called Kantara. They had collaborated with Appalachian Scotch Irish musicians and produced an album simply called Arab Appalachian Music. <laughs> I thought this was so funny since I was Arab and I was and Scotch Irish. I'd like to share with you a unique synthesis of two distinct musical traditions that have a shared rhythm, but also a recollection of a past. Thank you. 
from the tribe of my father, one that many see as being patriarchal, that the other tribe that had the most profound influence on my identity and growth came. And that was the tribe defined by my gender, the tribe of women. I came from a very strong matriarchal family, and this seemed to be true of many of the immigrants from Hatshit. Now, much has been written about the patriarchal societies in the Middle East. However, my taita, my grandmother, Omi, and my four aunts, Idi, Emily, Sadie, and Josie, ruled the family. You see, I came from a Balad Niswan, a land of women. I recall having conversations in college that I had a Middle Eastern family that was, well, kind of unusual because they were matriarchal. I had done research on matriarchal families of the Middle East, and the closest I found was that Jewish families traced their lineage through their mothers. Now that's a giant leap to group and gender dynamics. But it did strike me kind of as interesting since our family always traced their lineage through their mother. Then a few years ago, I found an article written by Neela Risk in about, it was around 2010 on the perception of gender inversion between Lebanon and Australia. And to my surprise, she was not just writing about Lebanon, but the migration of the Hachi to Lebanon, of, of Lebanon to Australia. In her research, she found that female power existed as a contradiction to and despite patriarchal structures. It was the first evidence that supported how I saw my family structure and many of the families that came from Hashi. My aunts were now larger, uh, now part of a larger construct, that Balad Niswan. They were strong, opinionated, and independent. They took great pride in the fact that they could trace their lineage not through my grandfather, but through my grandmother, back into the pages of the Bible. You see, my grandmother was in Azar, and even though we were always actually Nassars, not Nasser, but we say Nasser now, we were always Azar in the lineage of Joseph, Moses, and Jesus. Now, it wasn't just about pride for them, so I don't want you to think that they were like prideful women, but it was about something much more. It was about belonging. Tribes are about a sense of belonging to something that is greater than ourselves. Now, my Taita Omi, by the time I was small, she had lost the power to speak after several strokes, but she was still the center of the family. And even without words, everyone knew what she expected. She and my Jiddu grandfather had nine children, five boys and four girls. There was my father, Joseph, my uncle, George, John, Ray, and Jimmy. But in my family, the source of power and strength emanated from the tribe of women, Ida, Sadie, Emily, and Josie. Sometimes when I was a kid, I would say this one word, Ida, Sadie, Emily, Josie, Ida, Sadie, Emily, Josie, Ida, Sadie, Emily, Josie. You know, they grew up in the 30s and 50s, yet they were really strong, independent, and forward-thinking women. My aunt Ida, the oldest child, was pulled out of, the school, pulled out of school at the age of 10 to help her mother raise her siblings and take care of the house. She would always say, Umi, please, I want to go to school too. Why shouldn't I go to school? I remember hearing that story when I was little over and over again as a way to tell me, education is important and a privilege and you should work hard at it every day. My Aunt Ida eventually married a Yes Isa, a Palestinian refugee and a merchant. He passed away soon after their third child and my Aunt Ida had to work and support three children. She eventually opened a restaurant a tavern, which my other family wasn't real happy about, and she was very financially successful. This woman, who did not even have a second grade education. My Aunt Sadie married Julius Thomas, also from Hachi. She helped found the Lady Society at the church, founded the Wednesday and Friday Lebanese lunch fundraisers, in hopes to procure a Maronite priest for that church. She ran the church kitchen for many years and was instrumental in bringing what was the second, after 20 years, Maronite Catholic priest to St. Louis. Why was that important? Because she stood up to the patriarchal power structure of the St. Louis Roman Catholic Church Archdiocese, who did not want to allow a Maronite church to exist, who looked down on an immigrant community, but who did not know their strength and their pride. It took 15 years, but when she, what she, but when she accomplished it, in 1967, 
a priest who came, and who just actually passed away this week, turned the perception of the Lebanese in St. Louis around. And then there was Emily, oh my God, Emily, completely independent. She was married three times, divorced twice, and she said she doesn't need any man ever to support her. And then there was Josie. She never married, she always worked, and after my grandmother's death, she became the matriarch of the family. She was opinionated and tough. She did not mince words, but she loved like no one else. Everyone in her family was important. She never forgot a birthday, whether it was a niece, a great niece, a nephew, a cousin, a nephew-in-law, and she always sat at everybody's bedside when they were in the hospital. She was our center. You see, more than anything, I come from the Ladnaswan, a tribe of women, who instilled in me the importance of being self-sufficient, that women were equal to men. Well, actually, they thought we were better than men. <laughs> from these women, I learned about strength, perseverance, belief in oneself, and most importantly, unconditional love. They told me you can be anything you want to be, but you see, they didn't have to tell me anything because as my Aunt Jo would always say, actions speak louder than words. And their actions, well, they spoke volumes. And it's because of these women, I've always understood the importance of being in this tribe, this tribe of women. It is affecting me both on a conscious and subconscious level. It has guided me personally, socially, and politically my whole life. My indoctrination into this tribe, well, it's not a conscious decision. I mean, I was, my gender was female. Obviously, I was gonna be part of the tribe. But those four women made me understand that I had an obligation to the tribe, and it was more than just belonging that we all always have an obligation to our tribes. And it was an obligation that I should cons constantly strive, that I should constantly learn, that I should constantly teach, and I should always be a catalyst for change. It's what called me to action in sixth grade to call out a male faculty member who felt he could treat the girls differently than boys. It affected how I formed relationships I formed relationships with women friends that began almost 50 years ago and that continue today even though our social and political views are different now. Our shared experiences, our stories, and our <coughs> love for each other makes us a tribe. You see, tribes, they can hold us together even when we have differences. It moved me from a public high school to a private all-women's college, St. Mary of the Woods, which was the oldest Catholic women's college this side of the Mississippi, Mississippi. It was run by the Sisters of Providence, who were some of the most authority-questioning women I have ever known. As a matter of fact, they were like holding masses when women can't hold masses. So they said, we don't care, we're gonna have a mass. And we're like, okay. So <laughs> they activated me politically and socially. It moved me to start the first NOW chapter on our campus, to join Moperg, and to walk in the last march in Chicago to ratify the ERA. It drove me to take women's studies courses after getting my BA, and eventually led me to over 30 years of advocacy for women and women's rights, and to be involved with the Women's Caucus for Art, and it made me, yes, yeah, the F word, I'm a feminist. And oh yeah, that's another tribe, we'll talk about that another time. While I was in college, I began to move into another tribe, and again, not consciously at first, and that was a tribe of artists. My entrance into this tribe traversed a long stretch of time. I didn't enter it because I always belonged. Some people just have this innate talent and they always make work. But I had these kind of forays into it off and on throughout my life. Now, of course, I was always involved in the arts, but they actually were more the performing and writing and not the visual arts. Of course, so when I was in third grade, yeah, I had my first piece of work in an exhibition at Famous and Bar in downtown St. Louis. <laughs> I was so excited, my whole family was excited. And then they said, what is that? <laughs> I go, it's abstraction. They go, what's the abstraction? I'm like, okay. They go, why didn't you paint a dog? The other kids painted dogs. I'm like, <laughs> So I also 
sang in the children's and adult choirs in church. I played guitar, believe it or not. In high school, I was under the tutelage, if anybody knows, Dell of Thetford, and sang in concert choir, in gospel choir competitions, and I sang the Messiah with members of the St. Louis Symphony, all because of Dell of Thetford. I was also in art club, and I worked on several murals where I actually met Ben for the first time. When I went off to college, I was editor of the literary magazine. I wrote short stories and poems and had several published. I was also editor of the school newspaper. Shout out for MassCom. Okay. <laughs> it was there I took my first photography classes, and I fell in love with it. I mean, I spent all my time late at night climbing through the transom so I could get into the dark room so I could work all night long. But I never at that time thought of myself as a photographer and artist. It was just something that all of a sudden I loved to do. I had actually planned on getting out of school and going and getting my master's degree and being a social worker. So when I graduated from college, I kind of stopped making photographs. For me, the creative process was less in the camera and more in the dark room. And I didn't really come back to it for maybe six or seven years later when I started taking some classes right down the road here at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. I took classes in art history, in women's studies, and photography. Though I didn't realize it, that was the beginning of my movement into another tribe that I'm going to talk about today. I began exhibiting at the encouragement of Tom Patton, who was my photo professor, and Yael Evans, who was my art history and women's studies professor. My work started out very traditional in a sense, not necessarily in subject matter or processes, but the confines of a two-dimensional space. Fifteen years after completing my BA, I entered the master's program at Webster University in art history and theory with an emphasis in studio art. I had officially entered the tribe of artists. Now one group of people that seems to be more tribal than any, yeah, artists. There are so many groups and so many subgroups in the art world. Some defined by medium, some by style, some by how much education you have or what gallery you show in. And then there's insider art and outsider art. The art world, it's littered with tribes. It's at this juncture that my work started to move from the two-dimensional space to kind of installation and sculpture. And it also began to reflect not aesthetics, but my way of, uh, but my way of seeing both socially and politically. In the exhibition, Fred, the Dismantling of American City at the Midtown Art Center, I focus on white flight and the destruction of North City. And then I started to investigate work much more about who I saw myself as a person, kind of culturally, religious, my gender identity. I developed a work under the series from the blood of my grandmother, and there's some pieces out in the lobby today. The ongoing series melts quilting and embroidery with dress patterns, altered books, photographs, and found objects in an investigation of familial relationship, cultural taboos, and their places in the formation of our identity. This kind of tribe of artists, well, I hate to say, was really not for me the most welcoming or supportive tribe. Of course, the first qualities of a tribe are history and commonalities, and those that existed, but what I found lacking was acceptance, support, and well, history, yeah, really wasn't my history. It was a history that was largely defined by race and gender, and that was white, Western, and European men. While I belonged because I was an artist, it kind of stopped there for me. I was working in a medium that was not widely accepted as an art form at the time, photography. I was a woman, I was an Arab, and I was making work about my gender and my identity, all of those things that define my art. Feeling disheartened, I almost stopped making work for about a year, and then I came across an article in the Post-Dispatch about a group of women meeting in St. Louis called the Women's Caucus for Art. I attended the meetings and found not only kinship, but also acceptance and openness. I had found my tribe and they differed from all other tribes that I had been in because I chose this tribe. I embraced this tribe, and it allowed me the space to make work about my experience of being a woman, of being an Arab, of being a minority. It provided me support, it gave me confidence, and more than anything, 
It valued my voice. See, that's one of the most important aspects of a tribe. It values you. You are important. It values your voice. The Women's Caucus has been the vehicle through which I have claimed my tribe for almost 30 years. It has not had an impact on my life choices, my career, my art, and my activism. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Women's Caucus for Art. The organization began in 1972 when a group of women met in an, at the annual College Art Association Conference in San Francisco. The room was overflowing and they came to discuss sex discrimination in higher education especially in art departments. After the meeting, they concluded that there was a need for representation for women, and they immediately formed an organization called the Women's Caucus of the College Art Association. By 1974, only two years later, the CAA, the College Art Association, told the Women's Caucus, you can't use our name. You're too political. You're too social. We don't like what you're doing. You're marching in parades. And so they said, fine. And the Women's Caucus moved from being a committee to being an independent organization able to set its own goals, create its own vision, and to begin to value the voices of women in the art world. In 1979, the Lifetime Achievement Awards were established. They were the first awards ever to recognize the contribution of women in the arts and their profound effect on the larger society. The awards honored their work, their vision, their commitment, and their sheer determination to make it. The first awards were presented in President Jimmy Carter's Oval Office in the White House to Isabel Bishop, Selma Burke, Alice Neal, Louise Nevelson, and George O'Keefe. And excuse me for reading all the names, but I always feel it's important that you read people's names out loud. And last year, they honored four very important women, social activists, artists, educators, and I'm going to read their names, and I encourage you to look up them up. Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell, Audrey Flack, Martha Rosler, and Charlene Teeters. Eric, I know you know Charlene. Today, WCA is committed to recognizing the contribution of women in the arts, providing women with leadership opportunities and professional development, expending networking and exhibition opportunities. I mean, it's a long line of stuff supporting local, national, and global activism. Being part of the Women's Caucus for Art means you are an activist, and advocating for equity in the arts for all. The Women's Caucus for Art is an NGO, a non-governing organization of the United Nations, and they utilize art as universal language to engage artists, other NGOs, and society on a broad range of topics from gender equality to racial equality and to environmental sustainability. And this mission, this mission, this tribe has become my passion. For me, WCA is not about making art and exhibiting my art and being successful and making sales. It's about so much more. It's about believing in and supporting the values of the tribe. It provided me with a sense of identity, of knowing our shared history, not the history written in history books, nor the history written on museum walls, but a history that needed to be written and rewritten and rewritten. It provided me opportunities not only to network and make my art, but also to become a leader. I moved through the local to the national organization. I served as the president and now as the legacy director, and I've represented WCA, WCA at NGO United Nations conferences. There are so many members of this tribe. They have varied interests and belief systems. They come from different backgrounds and experiences. Yet this tribe defines us and unites us despite our differences. This tribe has so many stories of struggles and accomplishments. Women who were on the forefront of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the LGBTQ movements, the environmental movements, from names like Faith Ringgold to Gloria Steinman to Amalia Mesa Baines to Judy Chicago to Diane Burko and to the one woman I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today who had a profound effect on my life, and that is Beverly Buchanan. Now, some of you may recognize her name. I heard a woo in the audience, so somebody did. Um, I brought a national exhibition of her work to our campus a few years back. Beverly, gosh, 
She was a storyteller, and she could sit for hours in her rocking chair with a big old stogie cigar out the side of her mouth and share one story after another with you. When you were with her, you felt like you were sitting in a place of history, a sacred place. She had a way of making you feel like you were family and that she had known you your whole life. I had the pleasure of spending time with her um, on several occasions before her descent into Alzheimer's and her subsequent death. The first time was in February 2011 when I presented her with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Caucus for Art. When I called and told her they were giving her the award, she said, I have been waiting for this my whole life and now I can die. That night I had my first opportunity to hear her stories, stories of her life, of her struggle and her work. She's forthright, humorous, blunt. She kind of reminded me of my Aunt Jo. And she made me smile, she made me laugh, and she made me tear up all within an hour. I visited with Beverly again in the summer of 2012 at her home and studio in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We spent hours talking, but not talking about her passion for art, but her passion for collecting. She collected everything from other people's art to model cars to matchbook covers to dolls. Her house was just full of things and memories, but one of her favorite things to collect were chairs. She especially loved chairs. And the rooms were filled with chairs, from Eames to Mylan. I'm gonna tell you, there were so many chairs, you couldn't get into any rooms, and you couldn't sit on the chairs because there were chairs on top of chairs. <laughs> and her newest addition, the last time I was at her house, was a ghost chair, actually a child's ghost chair. And she was very fond of it. And Beverly had said to me, you know, Jan, Jane told me I can't buy any more chairs. Now, Jane was her caretaker and friend for many years. And I said, well, why not, Beverly? And she said, I have too many damn chairs. And I'm like, well, she goes, I want another ghost chair. And I go, well, Jane has two grandchildren. She goes, yeah. She goes, you hear that, Jane? Jan said you have two grandchildren. I guess I need two ghost chairs. It's only right. Jan said it. I said, yep, Jan said it. It has to be true. So actually, Jane got her another ghost chair. <laughs> um, but after that, Beverly and I spoke on many occasions. Um, I visited her one more time before her death. But she talked a lot. She would be a storyteller. She'd tell you about her work and her life and what motivated her to make her work. It's interesting, though, that Beverly wasn't educated in the arts. She was educated in the sciences. She had three degrees, a BA from Bennett College and two MAs from Columbia University. But she was always making art. She stated that when she went, she went to the sciences because she felt as an African-American woman, she needed to be an example and to give something back to her community. She took a job as a health educator, but at the same time, under the table, when nobody knew, she had enrolled in the Art Student League in New York City. It is at this time she began her friendship with the very famous and well-known artist, Ramir Bearden, who she credits with being her mentor. Buchanan spoke to me often about what it was like to be an African-American woman in the arts, what it was like to be a woman in the arts in the 70s and 80s. She said, there are tendencies in this art world, Jan, to pigeonhole you. You're a woman artist, you're a black artist. Well, I'm a good, solid black woman who happens to be an artist. Beverly never minced words. She said that she and other women artists would often get together to share their work. She goes, here we were, Jan, and we were trying to compete with these big boys, and they're all making this big work. Paintings that were huge, six, eight feet wide, because people thought scale had something to do with value. And we would be at these critiques, these groups, talking about our work that was often really kind of small and personal. She goes, I remember one time I was showing some slides and saying, well, the piece is about 14 to 70. And from the back of the room, somebody yelled, feet, 14 to 17 feet. And she said, they all burst out in laughter. And she said, we all laughed, and we started referring to everything we made in feet. Because if size has value, then our work's going to have value, too. 
By 1977, Beverly had left the science behind and became totally engaged in her art. She related to me, though, that her mother had a hard time with her being an artist and would always say, my daughter is an educator in the city of East Orange. It's really interesting that until Beverly received the Guggenheim Award in 1980, her mother never referred to her as an artist. And Beverly said, and that night when she got the award, her mother looked at her and said, you're an artist. And Beverly cried. It was also late in the 1970s that Beverly decided to leave New York City behind and return to Georgia. Now you can imagine all her women artist friends were telling her, you can't do that. We work too hard to get to where we're at. If you go to Georgia, who's going to see you? And who's going to see your work? And there is some truth to that, because I think Beverly remained very much it's an unappreciated artist until after her death. And now everybody knows who she is. Anyway, she said, I had one woman friend who said, you just can't go to Georgia. You can't go. And she said, why? You're going to get worms. You can get worms in Georgia. And she goes, where do you think I'm going? Georgia's like right, the, the right south. It's just not that far away. And, but her friend insisted. She said she really thought twice about going back, but she just had this desire to return home, to return to her people, to return to her tribe. She said her mentor, Ramir Bearden, said to her, Enjoy your life. Life is an adventure. Beverly spoke fondly to me of her days in Georgia. She was always stopping by the car to pick up old pieces of wood from the side of the road to use in her work and exploring places with her camera. The shacks that scattered the landscapes became the inspiration for her work. The places and spaces were her story, her history, her tribe. She said, I believe the entire world is descendant from shacks. After a while, she built a reputation in the town. She said, people would run up to me and tell me of homes or shacks they found. Another time, someone took me to a shack, and there was a woman living in there with her six children in one room. She said, we knocked on the door, and I walked in. And what did I see in the middle of the room but this beautiful ebony table? And she said, I said to the woman, do you know what you have in your living room? And the woman said, a bony table. And Beverly said, yeah, an ebony table. That's worth a lot of money. Well, you could sell that. Where did you get it? She goes, well, I found it on the side of the road. So that was the thing about Beverly. She was this kind of storyteller. But she said to me, can you imagine that, Janice? This beautiful ebony table inside that old shack. She said, you can look at a building, but you never really know what's inside. They're just like people. And that idea is magnified in her artwork. Often dilapidated shacks are portrayed as being full of life, painted in bright and vibrant colors. These places are not only places of her memory, but also the stories of the people who inhabit them, the folks as she called them. You see, they were her tribe. And the shacks represented the beauty, the complexity, the history of her tribe. I have been blessed my whole life to be surrounded by communities of people like Beverly, tribes who have shown me support and believed in me, beginning with my very big ethnic, sometimes smothering family. They formed my first tribe, and then there were other tribes, cultural, social, political, educational, all of these circles made me who I am. <coughs> Tribes make you who you are. It is said that one of the greatest factors in the success of a species is the ability to harness the power of collectiveness, the power of finding your tribe. Wanting to identify with a tribe, arguably, is still a very important basic part of what it means to be human. Part of, the success is, part of that success is dependent on individuals thriving, and part of that involves our fundamental need to be part of something bigger than ourselves. We crave the emotional, the psychological, and the physical benefits that being part of a tribe or a group provide. Without that feeling of belonging, we quite simply fail to thrive. The Rosada Effect was a series of studies that first began in 1966, which observed a close-knit Italian-American community 
in Rosetta, Pennsylvania. The village came to be a living laboratory because social researchers wanted to know how they were able to live long and happy lives. The men in the village, they smoked, they drank copious amounts of wine, and they spent their days, long days, immersed in hard labor working 200 feet below in slate quarries. The burning, smoking question in those researchers' brains, why was this community so healthy, free of disease, crime, and yes, just so darn happy? They drank, they smoked, they ate a poor diet. Well, you know what? It seemed that those nightly tableside rituals, buried in jolly laughter, nourished both their spirit and their body. You see, it was their tribe. In The Power of the Clan, an updated study that covers a period from 1935 to 1984, they found that mutual respect and cooperation within the Rossetti community contributed to the health and welfare of the tribe. That love and acceptance for each other translated into longevity. So why did that Rosetta community form? Well, this is interesting. Tracing the history, sociologists found that the English and Welsh who dominated that corner of Pennsylvania, yep, shunned immigrants. The Rosettis built their own tribe and culture that revolved around hard work, followed by joyous celebrations and love. Everyone worked in this community towards a common goal, a better life for their children. While this study, while this study had to do with a group of individuals, despite all circumstances, why they lived a longer and happier life, it illustrates the importance of tribes. They were a tribe, and the tribe and the interaction of the tribe sustain them both physically and emotionally. Why is this important? Humans must remain connected. We need each other. Research from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon indicates that feeling connected to others protects us from stress and sickness. Social support can broadly be defined as the perception of meaningful relationships that serve as a psychological resource during tough times. The findings from the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology reveal that personal benefits of social groups come not only from their ability to make people feel good, but from the, their ability to make people feel capable and in control of their lives. And according to the experts, the importance of finding your tribe should never be underestimated. Tribes can provide a sense of purpose, a reason to interact with others, and even proven health and well-being benefits. This can be especially true in tertiary educational environments, which leads me to my current tribe. A tribe that I've been a part of since I walked onto this campus 16 years ago, St. Louis Community College, but especially Florissant Valley. Our tribe and culture revolve around hard work followed by moments of joy, celebrations, and love. Sound familiar? There is mutual respect here and support. Everyone works in this community towards one common goal, educating the next generation of our leaders, building the future of our community, our country, and our world. It's hard work. It takes dedication, and more than anything, it takes belief. Now, the structure of our tribe, well, it's changed over the years. Members have come and gone. We have faced enrollment highs and enrollment lows, financial gains and financial woes. We have faced the best of times, and we have faced the worst of times. There are hardships and changes beyond our control, but we will rise above them because we are a community. We support each other. We have a common goal. We are a tribe. It is said that you only rise as high as the support of the tribe that you are in. The tribe here at Florissant Valley and at St. Louis Community College has supported and given me tools and space to grow. From an adjunct professor to an instructor to, to three temporary full-time contracts, to an assistant professor, to an associate professor, to the photography program coordinator, to the gallery director to the Chair of the Arts and Humanities Department, to the Interim Dean of Liberal Arts, 
and now to the Academic Dean of Liberal Arts. In a recent interview for the Academic Dean, I related my experiences of coming to Florissant Valley for the first time. I'd never heard of this place. I'd heard of Merrimack, I've heard of Forest Park, but Florissant Valley, really? There's a college out there? That's what I thought. And I kind of used this analogy in the interview, you know, kind of when you look for a house and you go from house to house and you're looking for something that's more than a structure. You're looking for something that's more than a place. You're looking for a feeling. And you know when you walk into it, you know it's the right one. You feel it in your bones. You feel it on your skin. You feel it in your history. It is where you belong. Well, that's how I felt the first time I walked onto this campus. I was home. All my wandering, all my experience, all the tribes I have been in led me here. I was home and I have found my forever tribe. And so today I'm going to end this lecture with the poem that I began with last April. And I also ask that at the end of the poem you pick up your frogs, leap higher, farther, and join in with the Umsal Ensemble as they lead us out of the auditorium and into one great semester because this is one damn good try. Tribe, we said, declared, those words resound in my heart, an echo of the ancient horn, the sound that calls me home, and marked the way and bade me welcome when the time of wandering had ended. We are tribe, such power in those words, an act of faith to believe in one another, 
to trust each other, to know that we stand together in the face of any adversity. We are tribe. Such solace in those words, to know that we are not alone, that kith and kin have gathered once again to celebrate our strength, to encourage one another, to find their power in the knowledge that as each one grows, the whole becomes the more, the thing that we have been searching for. We are tribe, a thing of wonder, a gathering of wisdom and experience, goodwill and the desire to be for one another, that which we search for inside of ourselves. We are tribe, we are tribe, we are tribe. Each time I hear those words repeated, each time I feel those words affirmed, I hear echo deep inside. Welcome, welcome, welcome home. We are tribe, Chimagwe. We are tribe, Be Beneath. We are tribe, Ashale. We are tribe, Namaste. We are tribe, we are tribe, St. Louis Community College. We are tribe, Florissant Valley. We are tribe. Thank you.